Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. King Ahebe Uwabe was unique among the men of Igbo land in colonial Nigeria. There weren't many kings in Igbo land at all. While West Africa was politically diverse with a range of governing structures, Igbo land was largely in the 19th and early 20th centuries, characterized by decentralized gerontocratic systems, essentially rule by a council of elder men. Mm. European observers like the very, very racist Mrs. Leith Ross praised the Igbo peoples she encountered for their predisposition to democracy. So King Uwabe ruled where few kings had before. But the infrequency of kingship is not what set Uwabe apart. More importantly, in a world dominated by councils of old men, where political, social, economic, and spiritual roles were meted out in a complementary but rigid dual-sex system, King Ahebe Uwabe was a female who became a man. I'm Avril Earls. And I'm Marissa Rhodes. <laughs> no, not really. I'm Sarah Hanley Cousins. And we're your historians for this episode of Dig. <laughs> Ahebe Uwabe, an Igbo female Eze, or king, was born sometime near the end of the 19th century in Nsukka. The Igbo are an ethnic group who mostly live in the south, central, and southeastern parts of Nigeria. This region is also known as the Biafra. Today, the Igbo are estimated to make up about 18% of the Nigerian population. If you're familiar with the writings of Chinua Achebe, the people and places that he discusses in his fiction are generally Igbo, including the village and characters of Things Fall Apart. Enugu Azike, where Ahebe Uwabe was born, is a large town in Enugu, a state in southeastern Nigeria. So for most of the 20th century, Nigeria was under the control of of the British. Uh, this imperial subjugation started earlier in the 18th century when English, Scottish, and Welsh missionaries made inroads in evangelizing Christianity, building churches and schools and hospitals. By the 1850s, the British sent armies to begin long and violent campaigns to save the heathens, to civilize them, and bonus to take control of the vast wealth of natural resources the West Africans weren't utilizing sufficiently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just the bonus. That, yeah. that was not no. the motivating factor. What? No. Oh, we just, you just know. Just a side. Oh, side, side hustle. Yeah. In 1885, concerned about the imperial aspirations of a newly unified Germany, the British agreed to gather with the other Europeans to carve Africa into zones of so-called ownership. The rules of the Berlin Conference of 1885 required that hopeful imperial powers prove existing infrastructure in order to claim a particular territory. Uh, and of course, because of a long tradition of religious imperialism and military imperialism, the British had roads, administrative buildings, barracks, and more dotting the West African landscape. The region, including what would eventually be the state of Enugu, was granted to the British by the other European states in attendance. Uh, and of course, no Africans were present at any, for any of the decisions made at that conference. We know about Ahebe Uwabe because of the work of historian Nwando Achebe, who found a reference to this female king in the records of British colonial administrators. Achebe points out that Uwabe was anomalous. Female kings weren't common in West Africa by any means. But the fluidity of gender in Igbo society meant that females could perform typically male roles, both temporarily and sometimes permanently. Uwabe successfully manipulated the loop and the soft spots in the system to take on increasingly more powerful roles in her community, culminating in her position as Eze. 
But as Achebe shows, Uwabe also ultimately overstepped the boundaries of gender fluidity and was knocked from power by the very colonial system that she used to seize power in the first place. The oral histories that Achebe collected in Enugu Azike suggests that Uwabe's family had some hard times when she was a kid, probably around 13 or 14 years old. Like 70% of West Africans, Uwabe's parents were farmers, and they'd had a few bad harvests that put the family into dire financial straits. There'd also been a series of illnesses in the household. And so seeking answers to these misfortunes, Wabe's father visited a diviner. Before and during colonization by the Europeans, the Igbo worldview was shaped by an understanding of two distinct realms, the spiritual and the human. Within each of these worlds, there is a social hierarchy. A supreme god was at the top of the spiritual realm, and a king or queen or elder was at the top of the human realm. Next, on the spirit totem pole, were lesser gods who were conduits to the supreme god. And then there were titled men and women, warriors, workers, and slaves, in that order on the human side. These two realms were always in communion. There were, of course, special people who facilitated communication between the human and the spiritual world, like Catholic priests and Muslim imams and Judaic rabbis. There were priests, priestesses, spirit mediums, and diviners, all of whom connected humans to their gods. Religious authority was not held solely by men in West Africa. Among the people of Ninobe, for example, only the priest, a man, and a Agba Ekwe, a, a woman, were permitted to speak directly to the supreme goddess of the region, Idamili. But there were some sex-based boundaries that could not be transgressed in Igbo society. In pre-colonial and colonial Nigeria, only male-bodied men, for example, were allowed to interact with masquerades. Masquerades in the masked spirits uh, that were paraded on, in these masquerades were basically like secret societies of full men, effectively men who had passed the final initiation of masculine development. The significance of the masquerade can be seen in a scene from Chinua Achebe, uh, who was Wando Achebe's father's uh, Things Fall Apart. Okay, so so a, a quote here from from Things Fall Apart. It happened during the annual ceremony, which was held in honor of the Earth Deity. At such times, the ancestors of the clan, who had been committed to Mother Earth at their death, emerged again as Egwugwu through tiny ant holes. One of the greatest crimes a man could commit was to unmask the Egwugwu in public, or to say or do anything which might reduce its immortal prestige in the eyes of the uninitiated. And this was what Enoch did. The annual worship of the Earth Goddess fell on a Sunday, and the masked spirits were abroad. The Christian women who had been to church could not therefore go home. Some of their men had gone out to beg the Egwugwu to retire for a short while for the women to pass. They agreed, and they were already retiring when Enoch boasted aloud that they would not dare to touch a Christian. Whereupon, they all came back, and one of them gave Enoch a good stroke of the cane, which was always carried. Enoch fell on him and tore off his mask. The other Egwugwu immediately surrounded their desecrated companion to shield him from the profane gaze of the women and children and led him away. Enoch had killed an ancestral spirit, and Umofia was thrown into confusion. So the important caveat of male men's power will be important to our story later, but we wanted to give this sort of as an example of the centrality of these mass spirits, the Egwugwu, mm -hmm. um, to, to a Nigerian uh, or Igbo uh, society. Right. Um, so for now, though, we'll return to these diviners, right, that uh, uh, Hebe Uwabe's father visited. Um, a diviner was believed to be able to discern the will of the gods. The diviner told Hebe Uwabe's father that he had committed a grave crime against a kinsman and offended the goddess Ohe. All of the family's misfortune was Ohe's of revenge. According to Wandu Achebe, Ohe was the goddess of fer creation, fertility, and protection. She was known to punish individuals for inappropriate and offensive behavior like murder, thievery, and adultery. For things to get better, a hebe would have to be offered as a living sacrifice to appease the great goddess. 
Slavery in 19th century West Africa had changed from its earlier iterations as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. While myriad forms of slavery were common to this region of the continent, the European slave societies in the Americas created a pressure on places like Eboland to meet the constant need for more slaves. That demand wiped out entire villages along the West Coast, increased war and raiding purely for the purpose of capturing prisoners to sell, and in some places changed the very structure of social networks and kinship. But both before, during, and after contact with Europeans, slavery in West Africa included both human slavery, in which one human claimed ownership over another, and spiritual slavery. The sacrifice that the diviner demanded of a Habe's father was an enslavement of the latter kind. Spiritual slavery in West Africa is similar to the dedication of young men and women to Jesus as monks and nuns. Mm. They're effectively in the service to a god for the rest of their lives. But because the gods and goddesses of West Africa don't have lots of hangouts about sex, uh, spiritual slavery in West Africa was also transmuted from parent to child. The girls and women dedicated to a god or goddess bear children for their divine husband. Those children, in turn, belong to the deity. Mortal men are essentially sperm donors. So even though they are, I mean, they're having sex and becoming pregnant with mortal men, the Mm -hmm. child conceived is not considered that person's child, but rather the the deity's child. Because essentially, it's the husband who owns the children of any union. And the husband is not necessarily the person they're having sex with. No, the husband, in this case, they're married to the The god God, or goddess. And the god god or goddess is the husband. Yes. Oh, that's so fascinating. Just another um, example of how all of these things that Americans tend to believe are natural, Mm -hmm. um, that that these kinds of, that parenting relationships are just kind of naturally created by by the fact that like some people have penises and some people have vaginas and therefore a mom and a dad is mm-hmm. just a natural outcropping of he- being human yes is not true <laughs> not true <laughs> right? at all. yeah socially constructed right spiritual slaves who are given to gods or goddesses tend to be treated fairly well they are not allowed to live among regular people but they are fed and clothed and housed by communities that respect and revere the divinity and the dedicatees Dedicated ease. Mm-hmm. I love that word. Uh, <laughs> I'm so easily amused. There is another form of spiritual slavery that is the result of a heinous crime with the same hereditary qualifications, but without any of the kind of nice side benefits. But that's a concept, you know, for another day. In a legendary move, in and of itself, Ahebe Uabe refused to be dedicated to the goddess. She refused to pay the price for her father's alleged wrongdoings. She refused to accept her place as a pawn to be used by the old men in her world who held the power. And she refused to be enslaved, even if it was to a goddess. She ran away from home. So who doesn't love a good teen rebellion story, right? Yep. Teens rebelling even, you know, in Ebo land. Because she took this stand, she was banished from her home, from her family, and from everything she knew. She was driven north into Iglala land, where she had nothing to offer. No skills, no trade, no education. So what did she have? Her body. She sold her body. Prostitution was common in Nigeria prior to and during British occupation. Though pre-colonial prostitution was primarily a rural phenomenon closely regulated by social standards, prostitution in colonial British West Africa could be immensely profitable, particularly in the growing urban centers. One colonial official commented that prostitution in Nigerian cities was an extremely profitable venture and prostitutes were, quote unquote, itinerant gold mines. Though she was young and on the run and carrying a newborn in tow, uh, she'd given birth shortly after fleeing Nsuka, uh, a daughter that may have been the result of a rape. Igala land was ultimately a land of opportunity for Ahebe Uabe. Igala land had its own historical female king. In the 16th century, a woman called Ebule is said to have reigned as king, as Atta, or father of all people. That's what Atta means. Uh, This precedent may have facilitated Uwabe's eventual coronation, for it was the pressure of influential people in Igala land that helped Ahebe secure her own kingdom. 
uh, perhaps a people that knew a female king, even if she reigned 400 years ago, uh, was prepared for another. But long before she was king, Ahebe Uabe had to earn her way through land that was, for all intents and purposes, foreign to her. As a sex worker, she traveled. She learned the local languages and then the languages of the peoples she encountered in the bigger cities. Before long, she could speak Igala, Nupe, and Pidgin English, in addition to her mother tongue, Igbo. Her clientele increased in influence as well. She communed with British colonists, prominent Igala citizens, and eventually even the king of Igala land himself. In Igbo land, prostitution was not viewed by locals with derision or disgust. Rather, sex workers were referred to as free women. Their spaces were places where men could go and relax. They could be friends with men, unlike most women. Because sex workers were required to be single, they were not defying any social regulations. Unmarried women were allowed to do what they wanted sexually. Their bodies were their own. Rather than streetwalkers, sex workers in, in Igbo land, Nigeria, tended to work out of their homes or in hotels, which were eventually built for the purposes of a, a growing prostitute class. Hmm. Igala land, on the other hand, had strict rules about sexual chastity, and prostitution was largely underground. Women caught selling sex faced harsh consequences. While you put, you put this in here on purpose. I didn't! No, this was really a thing. While concubinage, <laughs> which I still believe is concubinage, was widespread and expected, it was seen as a separate system from prostitution. Most prostitutes in Igala land then were either widowed women, thus you know, not in danger of losing their virginity and being rendered worthless, or foreigners, Igbo, Yoruba, or other ethnic migrants who moved to Igala land cities to take advantage of the colonial infrastructure and money. It was in this context that Owabe made connections with important people in high places, relationships that helped her take her first step towards becoming a man. Beyond earning a living from sex work, Ahabi Owabe was ultimately successful as a businesswoman. She invested the money she made into various trading ventures. These, as much as anything else, proved essential to her success. She started in potash and palm oil, but quickly got into horses, turning small profits into large ones, and gained a reputation as an astute businesswoman. While palm oil production and small-scale buying and selling were traditionally women's work anyway, horse trading proved her prowess. At the height of her trading career, she was known as one of the most apt horse traders in the Igbo Igala borderlands. As a businesswoman and a successful sex worker, Hebe Uwabe made connections in Igala land, including British colonial officers. Igala land was already conquered by the turn of the century, and the British were using that as a staging point to move into Igbo land. Officially, the British were going to liberate the Igbo from slavery, which sounds pleasantly noble. Hmm. Their methods, however, were not. But they did not conquer Igbo land alone. Colonial records suggest that Ahebe Owabe traveled with the British army and helped them find the most advantageous paths to conquer her people. Local collaborators, those who'd been cast out from society and abused by the existing regimes, were essential to European colonial projects. These individuals would be central to the indirect rule model that the British employed in colonial Nigeria. We see this in Chinua Chebe's fiction as well. The Mufia sit villagers who join the Christian church and eventually become the police, tax collectors, etc., were the twins who'd been cast out into the evil forest, or Okonkwo's son, who was not strong enough to be a man like Okonkwo. So people like Ahabe Uwabe cast out of her village and family for refusing to be dedicated into spiritual slavery to pay her father's debts, who was probably raped and definitely had to sell her body just to get by. People like Ahabe had every reason to join the other side to accept positions of power where they could change the system that had hurt them, where they could be powerful after so long of powerlessness. And then all that infrastructure that gave Britain colonial rights over West Africa, the Anglo churches, the schools, the prisons, the courthouses, 
These became the places where locals were trained and educated to do all the day-to-day operations of running a colony for the British crown. British West Africa was largely governed by West Africans. There were some Scots and Irish and Welsh and English fellows with their wives overseeing everything, but within a few years, they were able to turn the vast majority of the governance over to people like Ahebe Uwabe. Ahebe Uwabe returned home with the British. She immediately made allies among the political elite. As Nwandu Achebe notes, Ahebe was the only one in her village who spoke any English. She quickly set herself up as the intermediary between herself and her people. Ahebe was ultimately able to outmaneuver the man whom the British had initially appointed as headman of the village. The British tended to ignore the custom of having the oldest man and oldest woman of a village in the symbolic seats overseeing a village. They preferred young men who were more malleable to their machinations. A headman was necessary to the British colonial structure, however, to carry out the oversight of each village and to report back to the division head. Divisions are essentially zones or regions that the British carved West Africa into for governing purposes. Because the Igbo headman and headwoman were traditionally symbolic and without actual power, uh, governing power, the, the appointment of these young headmen imbued with all the authority that a cap with an embroidered British crown suggested, and that's what they were given, caps with British crown, embroidered on it um, as a symbol of their power. A little hat. A little hat. <laughs> uh, they were resented most of the time by the peoples of their villages. Yeah. It is interesting that the British appointed a hebe at all. They tended to dismiss West African women in the same way that they dismissed British women. There is nothing in the colonial records to indicate the circumstances at all, but the oral tradition suggests that she worked with the former headman, that they were friends or allies, and that she performed the duties of headman for him at times. This was in part because he still did not speak English, and she was able to fulfill that need in going between the village and the British. Ultimately, when he stepped down or possibly was removed, there were rumors of a murder, uh, Ahebe Uwabe was appointed head ma. Head ma? <laughs> head man. I thought it was like, oh, she's a woman, so we're going to call it head ma. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Uh, when she was appointed head man, vaulting her over one of the hurdles to accumulation of the titles and authority of men. And though the British did not comment on the lead up to her appointment, there are notes about her intelligence, loyalty to the British, and sensibility, all desirable traits for someone entrusted with colonial administration on His Majesty's behalf. Which is not to say that a female headman was accepted in Igbo land simply because the British said so. In European society at this time, positions of power were primarily occupied by men. With the rare exception, like Queen Victoria, newly installed on the British throne, or installed on the British throne in 1837, all true power was held by men. Further, gender was tied explicitly to sex in Europe. Only males could be men, and only females could be women. And by extension, only male-bodied men were permitted to occupy positions re- reserved for men: king, judge, tax collector, magistrate, father, husband. For those who transgressed these boundaries there were severe consequences male-bodied individuals who behaved or adopted the roles of women were sodomites and sentenced to death life imprisonment or if they were lucky just to public humiliation in the stockades (laughs) if they were lucky in pre-colonial Igbo land, gender was a performance, and sex and gender were not mutually assured conditions. Among the non-centralized Igbo, those governed by gerontocratic... Gerontocratic. Oh. Like geriatric. I, yeah. Gerontocratic. What did I say? Gerontocratic? You said, yeah. Well, that sounds good, too. Okay. Among the non-centralized Igbo, those governed by gerontocratic councils, there was a dual sex system of power, or a joint system of male and female government. Effectively, a jury of males would deal with the governing of men's issues, and a jury of women would deal with the governing of women's issues. 
there would have been a symbolic vestment of authority in the oldest man and the oldest woman in the village. But kings, the vestment of full political authority in a single individual, were extremely rare in Igbo land. And there had certainly never been a female king, at least not in living memory, as there had been in Igala land or other parts of West Africa. But there were instances where females performed the duties and roles of men in Igbo society. There was a gender fluidity that made allowances for certain rituals to be observed when a male-bodied individual was unavailable. For example, Ifiyama Dume tells the story of a male daughter, a concept that Wando, Wando Achebe actually calls a female son uh, because the sex of the individual remains constant and it's actually the social identity that's being adopted. Mm-hmm. So when one man, who was very important in his community of Nanobi, was ill and dying, he recalled his daughter uh, from her marital home back to his, his home. So essentially she was like not happy there. She'd been married really young. And so he he knew that she wanted out and he didn't have anyone and he didn't have any sons. Right. Um, and he, so he had no sons. He had no close male relatives either. So he chose to make her his son. Hmm. She would then have the status necessary to inherit his property. Okay. Her father returned the marriage payment and she became his son. After he died, she went to, to go work in his fields, uh, and some men challenged her right to do so because they did not recognize a female as having rights to their father's property. And the issue went to court. Uh, b- because her father had been a Dibia, or a religious leader, uh, the court ruled that she could not become a priest, uh, but that she could stay in her father's home and inherit his possessions. So the gender fluidity had its possibilities, but also its limits, right? She couldn't become Dibia, but she could inherit his property right. like a son. Yeah. Hmm. As a son, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, not like a son. As, As a son. Yeah. Yeah. Gender fluidity was rooted in the very belief system we discussed earlier in the episode. When girls like the young Ahebe Uwabe were dedicated to a goddess, for example, they were effectively married to that goddess. The goddess was their husband, a masculine role, and any children those wives produced would belong to the goddess. In Igbo land, what we refer to as a bride price is misleading. When a man paid a woman's family for her hand in marriage, he wasn't paying for her. Instead, he was paying for the right to any children she produced. <clears throat> Those could be his biological children or children that she, you know, begot with the guy next door. But he paid the, or specifically Philip, who lives next door. Um <laughs> But he paid the bride price, or what Nwandu Achebe calls the child price, to reflect the way this system actually works. To that end, a financially powerful woman could pay the child price for wives of her own. Then any children those wives produced would be hers. She could name them her heirs, and any daughters would bring bride or child prices of their own. In this way, she would be considered a female husband. There needn't and generally wasn't any sexual element to these relationships. They were accepted and they were fairly common. Ahebe Uwabe paid the child price for her brother's wives as well as for a number of wives for herself. She had the economic power to have as many wives as she wanted. Mm -hmm. So she has all of these wives. That doesn't mean that she was what we might consider a lesbian. No, not at all. And uh, sexual relationships between the women would have been harshly dealt with. Isn't that fascinating that they could... T- they could what we would call marry she could mm-hmm. have as many wives as she wanted but if she had sex with those wives that would be the problem right the marriage mm-hmm. wouldn't be the problem no. which in american society is almost flipped i mean we hate yeah. both right yeah as a heteronormative society we hate everything but yes. we would rather let people have sex with wh- whoever they want and because mm-hmm. we can just ignore it than give people the um institutional right to marry one mm-hmm. another although you know that changed in 2015 yeah yeah, yeah i know but, the, but it took a really fucking long but time. one of the arguments that people made was like do whatever you want in your bedroom but right. you can't but you can't get married because right. that's a different thing because marriage is this sacred religious institution right right, right. but this is flipped right this it's like flipped. marry yeah. whoever you want but don't you dare have sex with each other you know? right and not that that was a part of it no. necessarily right. but yeah and not that sex is a part of heterosexual marriage either Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> we totally just had this conversation when we were recording Elizabeth and Marissa's episodes. About sex? Yeah, about in sex heterosexual and relationships? Yeah. And marriage. And how marriage doesn't mean anything about sex sometimes. Sometimes. 
<laughs> Sometimes it does. Sometimes it bow, really chicka, does. Bow, wow. 18 children later. Mm-hmm. Mm. Or 18 orgasms later. That too. However you want it. Um, Maybe both. And actually, uh, Wandu Achebe describes the relationship that uh, Hebe Wabe would have had with her wives as like a really close friendship. So mm. like, when I have enough money, I will buy you. I'll pay your child price. Yeah. Let's and then we married. will live together. But we will sleep in different places because Wabe was a man. So she slept in her own room. You get your own bedroom then. Yeah. I get my own bedroom. And all of your wives have to sleep in the same bedroom. No, they all get their own huts. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. that, you know, I'd no. be bunking up. We'd be snuggling. It'd be a lot like Big Love, where they each get their own house in the compound. I I actually love that. I know. I think that that... Wouldn't it be really nice? It would. I think it would. I would think it would. Yeah. Really. Mm-hmm. I mean, I that was one of the things that I thought was so cool about Big Love was mm-hmm. like, you know... Living in a, I mean, it was complicated and whatever, but like environment, yeah, yeah, and you and it spreads childcare responsibilities around, mm. and it, it almost mm. frees women up in a way. I mean, obviously, it can be used for really misogynist purposes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's it's very interesting. Yeah, it is complex, almost like complex marriage, except complex marriage is is much more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we okay. We, we, we went we, all the yeah, way right. over to whatever it's called Oneida there for a second. Okay. We did. <laughs> so Wandu Achebe argues that colonialism actually expanded the gender fluidity possibilities, as evidenced by Achebe Uwabe's elevation from headman to then warrant chief, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and finally to king, which is what we sort of alluded to this whole episode. But she also noted that Nsuka society also policed and limited the extent to which colonialism expanded those boundaries. This limitation is also revealed in Hebe Uwabe's story. In October 1918, the British appointed a Hebe to the native court of Enugu Uzike. She was the only female warrant chief in all of colonial Nigeria. In fact, her position was so unusual that in all colonial records where she is mentioned as warrant chief, her name is followed by F to indicate that she was female. Mm-hmm. Like they really wanted you to know that. Yeah, well, they went, you know, just she's different. Right. Her appointment to warrant chief did not sit well with the elder men of her village. Already they saw her overstepping what they considered the boundaries of the dual sex political system of the Igbo peoples in in Asuka. Uh, but Ahebi did not care. <laughs> so, in fact, she almost immediately began working toward her ultimate goal of Eze. The British cared little for local politics as long as the colonial machine was operating smoothly. But Hebe did not turn to the British for the next phase anyway. She turned instead to the contacts she had made in Igala land as a businesswoman. She gained the support of the king of Igala land in her bid for forming a kingship of her own in Enugu Azike. There had never been a king in Enugu Azike before. Perhaps because it would be a new institution and also because of her successes as a headman and then as warrant chief, Ahebe maneuvered herself into the role of king in the early 1920s. She was crowned in Igala land and then rode a horse back home. The staff of her kingship held high in one hand, uh, basically like a, like a phallic staff, mm. waving it about. And a troop of musicians and dancers followed her, celebrating her new kingship. I, I think that that's just how I'm going to, like, when I go to the grocery store. like Not a, a horse. With a troop of, like, dancing, dancing people. Singing. Yes, I love it. Public display was important to Igbo life. The celebration was as much an affirmation of her kingship as a joyous occasion. It solidified her position as autocratic ruler, a position that was, in effect, already within her grasp as warrant chief, which held so much authority in and of itself. When building her massive palace, she need only point to a piece of land that she wanted, and the owner would gift it to her. I wish that that was still true. <laughs> The palace grounds contained a market, a court, a prison, a school, a retraining house. We'll get to that. Okay. A masquerade house, animal stables, several residential homes, guest houses, and a brothel. Everything you could possibly need. Mm -hmm. The market served as the main market for the region. There were houses for every man and for each of his wives. As king, a heavy continued to accumulate power through wealth and influence. (laughs) She had... (laughs) She had. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of yams. 
she had 12 barns of yams. <laughs> Yams were the king crop of Ebo land, and to possess them was a sign of wealth. Uh, Twelve barns worth of them. She required the men of the surrounding communities to work her fields in shifts. It was all surrounded by a short wall made of mud. It was made of yams. No, I'm just kidding. Um, king Ahebi entertained guests and dignitaries from all over, both European and locals. Her palace was, as Nwandu Achebe puts it, the showpiece of the town. Maintaining her masculine power meant maintaining the gender regime. Only virgin girls slept in Ahebe's bedroom. Little, little girls, like prepubescent girls. Women were not permitted in the masquerade house, uh, where the masked spirit resided. But presumably this did not count Ahebe, who was, for all intents and purposes, in you know, her mind and based on the titles that she had acquired, a man. And Ahebe kept a retraining school at her palace where men could send their unruly wives to be worked and beaten into better behavior. Handy. Yeah. As a man with many wives herself, or a husband with many wives herself, Ahebe knew the importance of keeping wives in check and well behaved. Some of those women ended up staying at the palace. Ahebe paid the child price to take them on as her own wives or as wives for her brothers or other relatives. Some stayed to work in the kitchens or perform other tasks around the palace. Maintaining the ideal construct of wife was important to the visage of masculinity that Ahebe had cultivated. Ahebe's own wives were expected to service the important men who came to the palace for visits, including the king of Igala land and British colonial officers. Service. Mm -hmm. In that sense. Sexual oh, service. Servicing. Children then born of these encounters were, of course, Ahebe's by right. Because she had paid for them. She had paid the child price. Mm. The local colonial police used Ahebe's brothel with regularity. Can I pause you here for a second? Oh, yeah. Um, so what was the, um, what was the motivation for owning, or I mean, owning isn't quite the right word, but having the right to those children was, were, were, did you have increased status based on how many children you had or was there? I think the economically it was because if you had daughters, then other people would pay you. Oh right, right, right. The bride price, the child price for right. those daughters, and then sons they could they work your work land for you. They work for you. Mm. They inherit your stuff, mm -hmm. and that's a sign. And you know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Maybe at one point they would have been your warriors, right? That kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. In addition to these gendered social rights that Ahebe observed and enforced in her palace. She also maintained a school to educate her own children and the children from the surrounding communities. At first, she hired a man named Jacob Elam to be the teacher in her school. Few children came from the neighboring communities, however. The local elders wooed Elam away from Ahebe's palace, telling him that the children would attend school if it was in the home of the eldest man in Ogurte, per tradition. So Elam went. Ahebe was not happy. She called the district police frequenters of her brothel, who rounded up the conspiring elders and sent for a new teacher to work at the palace school. As it turned out, the old men whom she'd ousted when she took autocratic rule of the region as king were fed up with King Ahebe. To them, she'd violated social mores. She'd refused to consult the elders when making political decisions. She used forced labor in her fields, which was a problem in and of itself. She took bribes and she allowed her employees to f forcibly take away other men's wives. These issues were going to reach a boiling point eventually, uh, but the last straw was when Ahebe tried to appropriate spiritual male power. Throughout her life, Ahebe had been building an air of mystery and power around herself. Beyond developing the economic means to earn influence and respect from those first months on the road fleeing her father and the goddess, Ahebe had been practicing a local custom of religious and spiritual ritual called, known as good medicine. Good medicine was intended to appease or to help one hide from gods to foster good luck. One could also produce bad medicine, cursing others and wishing ill on enemies. But all of the oral traditions surrounding Ahebe suggest that she was practicing good medicine, and in doing so, she cultivated the aura of spiritual mystery that aided her in the climb to the top. Medicine was a religious rite that wasn't restricted to men. 
The masquerade, however, as we suggested, was very much so. While women weren't allowed in Hebe's masquerade house, it seems likely that at least one female, Hebe herself, was. As Ao Onyenike notes in his book, The Dead Among the Living, quote, The masquerade serves the special function of differentiating males and females in Igbo society. It is the exclusive function of the full men, while the women are always excluded, even where a female character is portrayed in the masking. The social definition of full man, therefore, is the ability to control a masquerade, end quote. The masquerade was sacred. Women were supposed to flee in a masked spirit's presence, and it was effectively a tool of social control as well as spiritual significance. King Ahabe created and brought out her own masked spirit. This was to be the final rung on her ladder to full manhood. But according to Igbo tradition, that was not allowed. Even if she'd become a man as a headman, a warrant chief, and a king, she was still biologically female. And females were not permitted to create masked spirits, nor could they control a masked spirit. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. When King Ahebe presented her masked spirit at a masquerade, the elders ordered it to be taken out back and effectively destroyed. After the business with the teacher, Ahebe Iwabe was ready for a confrontation. She immediately took the elders to court. That unfortunately turned out to be a mistake. Though she'd been loyal and sensible and represented all the British wanted in their colonial administrators, she was also still just a woman to them. They heard the elders' position that the masquerade was a male realm of power. They looked at a Hebe Oabe and saw a female. The British, like all Europeans, still understood sex and gender as constants. They, f- they found in favor of the elders. A Hebe's masked spirit was never seen again. But more importantly, this moment represented a loss for a Hebe. She had been building her political power towards this moment of ascension into spiritual power. The elders tore that rug out from under her. As king, she had peaked. When she tried to seize the next rung of full man as the controller of a masked spirit, she was knocked down. Her political authority was never again absolute. Though she lived the rest of her life until 1948 as King Ahebe, she was never as secure, never as powerful as she had been before the masquerade. Discussion topics. Judith Butler or not. <laughs> <laughs> this is really fascinating. And it is, um, to me, this is such evidence of the social construction of gender oh, yes. as being different from, from sex. And mm-hmm. I actually, I'm, I'm going to kind of keep this story in mind when I, because when I teach this is something that I think a lot of people are more receptive to hearing now. I, I I remember when I was in college and I first learned this, like it felt like my brain was literally exploding. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah, I was yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. oh my God, what? Mm-hmm. Gender is a social construction? Like what does right. that even mean? You know? Mm-hmm. And I think that now um, college students are a little, like they have a little bit more of a familiarity with that idea. Yeah. But they still sometimes I have a hard time explaining to them what the difference is between sex and gender. Yes. And I think that this is such a good, this might be a good story to kind of illustrate that Mm -hmm. because she had all of the trappings of masculinity without the dick. And also of manhood, right? Right. Because the roles that she took on that she stepped into were, were the roles of men. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But even in that society, there were still restrictions, right? Because right. those were their social norms, and they had constructed around uh, the masked spirits that as an exclusively male-bodied mm-hmm. realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is interesting, too, because I know that there's sort of a... Um, a debate happening right now, and I'm this is out of my lane, so I... I probably shouldn't even be commenting on it, but I know that there's a debate right now among people who do trans history Mm -hmm. about, you know, when you, when do we, or when should we call people trans in the past? 
Um, and I can see someone taking this story and saying, well, this is a po- this is a powerful story of a trans man. Right. Um, and I don't think that that's really what was going on. No, but I mean, it depends on how you define trans, right? She is transcending yeah. the gender dichotomy and or, I, or the or d- d- gender boundaries. Like she's crossing gender boundaries, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then again, she's not really because the gender system has the fluidity to, like, it's not like a big deal that mm-hmm. uh, that this one female, this daughter, becomes a son. Right. Um, and there are other stories, and I couldn't find any of the good ones, but there's like a story about um, a man dies, and then he needs one of his sons to sit in and wear his clothes and sort of like do something so that's the spirit can rest or whatever oh okay but he had no son so a daughter would Mm. would sit there she would be her dad for for the purposes purposes of of that of this of this mourning period or whatever um and then there were you know there are also the spirit mediumship of eastern africa Mm -hmm. um, is a whole other ball game that you know is another story but essentially because that the two realms right the spiritual and the human right the spiritual is always like slightly above the the spiritual so a dead king the spiritual is always above slightly the human, above a human, above right. the human so a dead king is more powerful than a living king mm-hmm. so uh, most of the spirit mediums of east africa are women so a woman who is possessed by a dead oh, king's okay. spirit mm-hmm. she has more authority than a male king mm. that is really that is really really interesting right so there's yeah i mean there's a lot to be said of for the whole construction of gender right? yeah, yeah. And, and identities and, and how that this plays out in different places of the world. Yeah. If you can step outside of your tiny worldview, but, so but I mean, in terms of transgender, in terms stuff. of it, yeah. In terms of it being um, claimed in that way, I, right. I always, what makes me hesitate is like, do we know necessarily that she felt the way that, that people today talk about it as being, you know, a man being trapped in a woman's, skin right Right. um was that her experience or was she sort of taking on the roles of men in order to elevate herself socially Mm -hmm. without necessarily feeling intrinsically as though she was male do you know what i mean like can we can we know that or actually maybe more importantly does it actually matter it doesn't matter you know i think it's interesting i I listened to this and this is probably going to come up when we um in the other episode the victoria woodhall episode i listened to this podcast that some of you out there might listen to also it's called savage love um hosted by dan savage and and one of the things i've learned by listening to that it's just because this is not the world i live in and so i kind of you soak this in as you listen to other people's perspectives is that like people's sexualities and genders are so vastly diverse Mm -hmm. and that it's not as simple as like well now i'm a woman and therefore I need to have surgery or whatever right. um, in order to be as female as a female person should be and, and is supposed to be right. Like mm-hmm. you can be a woman that has a penis. Like mm-hmm. that's okay. Yeah. And there are people that want that. There are, there, mm-hmm. there are people who that, like sexually that is exciting to them and they, that's the kind of body that they want to be with, you know? Right. Um, Which is so this is, I'm that, sure there are yeah. listeners out there who yeah. think that I'm an idiot <laughs> for having like, just, it's just, you know, I'm a white hetero lady. And so these are things that, um, that I'm, that I learn kind of in the world. And I just, I, I love it. Challenging. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I love it. Mm-hmm. The more that I learn, um, African history, the more that I'm just fascinated by oh, it. And I want to learn more. Yeah. <sighs> no. Okay. So, well, yeah, I guess that wraps up. We got like way we off. We could talk about there. this forever. We could. We could. Um, but uh, if you aren't already, make sure you're subscribed uh, wherever you get your iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I don't know. I can't talk anymore. Um, if you like what you've heard. You'd be doing us a huge favor if you could rate and review us on iTunes. That um, it really helps a new helps us um, reach new listeners, and mm-hmm. um, and of course, tell your friends if they they yes. aren't listening and yes. you love them, you should suggest that they listen. Yes, uh, and you can find all of our show notes 
transcripts for this episode, some images that Sarah puts together beautifully for us, all at digpodcast.org. And I'll be sure to post uh, both of the book, the book we're reading for book club, the book I mentioned, the fiction book, mm-hmm. um, as well as all the books that I use for this, which was mostly things written by Wandu Achebe because she is the, uh, you know, the historian of this story. So thank you, Wandu. And she is awesome. Yeah, um, very awesome. And... Uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, mm-hmm. Pinterest. You can join our super secret tree club, fort club, house tree, bop shabop, <laughs> dig, get some history podcast quality pod squad. history yeah. meme yeah. content Lot. coming at you. Marissa has a meme for every new, every yes. new. You get your member. very own meme. You do. Yeah. Um, and uh, if this, if you like this episode, if you have thoughts about it if you want to kind of elaborate on our conversation um you know we are certainly not the the definitive experts on any of these things and we love 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 hearing from you so if you have something to add please um send us email join our facebook group post on our facebook page whatever um send us a message and we would really really love to talk more yes other than that thanks for joining us for this episode i'm avril and i'm sarah farewell bye Hey, true crime fans. Have you listened to Wine and Crime yet? We're a true crime comedy podcast hosted by three childhood friends who chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash our worst Minnesotan accents. Each week, us gals pick a true crime topic and pair it with a delicious wine before delving into the background and psychology behind the crime. Then we share and speculate wildly about a couple of bonkers cases related to the topic. Past episodes include necrophilia, cults, Crimes of passion, cruise ship disappearances, exorcisms gone wrong, all this over a bottle of wine, or let's be real, three. Listen anywhere you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wine and Crime Pod, and check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. Cheers! This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Avril Earls. Thanks for listening. Ahebe Uwabe. Oop, that was a higher octave. Ahebe Uwabe. <laughs> Spiritual slaves were given who are Okay, I'll try not to be so high pitched. Well you can do it when you're talking like that. Don't make that face. It's a perfectly fine face. It's a sarcastic face. No, it's not. Cap. <clears throat> Are you cold? No, I... Want me to put a blanket around your feet? Those could be his biological children or children she begot with... <laughs> <laughs> or... Among the non-centralized Evo, those governed by gerontocratic... <laughs> what is it? Gerontocratic. Not. Did I say gerontocratic? Yeah, you're saying Geronimo tocratic. <laughs> gerontocratic. 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 Jerry is in charge of the gerontocratic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Among the non centralized Ebo, those governed by gerontocratic <laughs> Wait, I really want it to be. This is so odd. Sure, it can be fine. Oh my god. I, I can say all of these Nigerian words. <laughs> I can't say. Not gerontocratic. Gerontocratic, okay.